Spirit of the living God, we come before you, Jesus, thanking you as always for your grace, your mercy, uh, your power, your love, and unfailing grace and goodness and mercy. Mm -hmm. As we get into your word, of course, Lord, we do ask to be built up, changed, edified, and uh, transformed, made new. We thank you, we praise you, we glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so we're in Deuteronomy chapters 14 and 15 today. Um, and this is called Hallelujah, Thank You, Jesus. <laughs> um, last week we were looking at uh, God telling Israel, you know, when you go in and you conquer the lands, destroy all the pagan uh, articles of worship and don't get curious and wonder how they used to worship their gods and start delving into that and then get led astray. And then he talks about uh, false prophets who can perform actual miracles, but the purpose of their miracle is to lead you astray from him. And so um, when we learned last week in chapter 13 that the Lord would allow false prophets to arise, um, these false prophets, Pro da -da -da. These false prophets would try to lead God's people into worshiping another God after they have performed supernatural signs. But we also learn why the Lord would permit this to happen. Um, in chapter 13, verse 3, the Lord said, You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or the dreamer of dreams, for the Lord had your Lord your God is testing you to know whether you would love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So I want to expand on what it means for the Lord to test in this way. Uh, first off, we have to remember that the Lord is not the author of sin, nor does he tempt anyone with sin. James 1, 13 and 14 states, uh, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone with evil. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So we are only tempted by our own wicked desires. And the Lord never tells us to stand and fight temptation. And I think that's where most people get it twisted. They want to run from the devil and fight temptation, but it's actually the other way around. He commands us to flee temptation. He even makes a way for us to flee and escape the temptations by saying, hey, you, check it out. I just opened up a window in that wall. Jump out of it. Run for us. Flee. <laughs> but he does test us. Now, remember, the Lord's tests are not about pass and fail. They're intended to purify and strengthen our faith in the Lord and to deepen our heart's devotion towards him. Um, and 1 Peter 1.6 says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there God is saying, if it's needed, I put you in the fire to purify your faith, to test it, to bring up to the surface the impurities and scrape them off. The Lord doesn't allow those tests, um, I mean, sorry, the Lord does not allow or bring those tests of purifying to see how much we love him or to find out how deep our faith is in him. He already knows it. So when it says the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord with all your heart or not, with all your soul, it's not to show him where our hearts and faith are. It's to reveal to me, to reveal to us where my love and my faith really lies. See, a lot of times, you know, as people, we say, this is for the Lord, and it's really not for the Lord. It's for me, and I'm trying to throw God's name on it to make it okay. And God is like, okay, so let me show you where your faith really lies. In Malachi 3, the Lord says, 
The Lord will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Okay, so the tribe of Levi was the priestly tribe and they served in the temple and all things that pertain to worship and religion in Judaism, right? But we are high priests. We are believer priests. And so we are, like the tribe of Levi, priests to the Lord. And so he purifies our hearts so that the offerings that we give him are of a pure heart. Psalms uh, 12.6 states this, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in the furnace of the earth, purified seven times. Now remember Jesus said, Sanctify them by your word, for your word is truth. So for us to line up with the pure word of God, that means taking your oh-so-beautiful heart and making it look like the word of God, right? So just think about how pure your heart is and how clear and, and spotless it is. And <laughs> now God is going to make you look like his word. And so there's no work to be done there, right? <laughs> Proverbs 17, 3 states, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. And remember, test is not pass or fail, but purify. Psalm 66, 10 states, for you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. I've never refined silver or gold. I mean, I used to have metal shop in school and all we had was aluminum. But what I understand from silver and gold is that the jeweler, he's heating up the metal or the, 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 the gold and silver and he's scraping the impurities off the top. And he knows it's ready when he can look in the pool and see his reflection. Zechariah 13, 9 states, I will bring one third through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. So what he's saying is, I'm going to purify them. I'm going to look down and see my face in you and say, you're mine. And your response is going to be, I'm yours. You're my God. Sometimes in our walk, our heart and our faith are not lined up with each other. So the Lord tests our purifies by bringing our love and obedience into one. And that's so that my heart is not going in one direction while my feet are running in the opposite direction, right? And so the Lord has to bring those two things together and that's his purifying so chapter 14 verse 1 you are the children of the lord your god you shall not cut yourselves nor shave the front of your head for the dead for you are a holy people to the lord your god and the lord has chosen you to be a people for himself a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth Okay, so when it says you shall not shave the front of your head for the dead, it means do not make any baldness between your eyes or shave the head above your foreheads in mourning for the dead. Okay, this is not including those who have a unibrow and make a <laughs> space in the middle. <laughs> in the pagan nations, the idol worshipers had all these satanic rituals of death and for dead people. They'd mutilate themselves. They, they'd cut their foreheads and scalp the top of their heads. And this was to show their great grief in honoring the dead person. But in reality, it's just a satanic worship of death. Okay? It also says, you shall not cut yourselves in worship for the mourning of the dead. In Islam, some of their most devout Muslims practice a ritual called tatbar. Tatbir is T-A-T-B-I-R. They do this 
in an act of worship to honor Hussein. He was Muhammad's grandson that got killed in battle by some other Muslims. Well, during their tat bar, tat beer uh, celebration, they sliced their backs and bodies with and heads with swords, making blood gush out. They even cut the heads of their babies. It's their holy, sold-out act of worship, mourning for the dead. Death cults. And if you go look it up online, just type in Muslims cutting themselves with swords, and you'll see all kinds of pictures and videos. But death cults always justify their blood sacrifices to the devil as a good thing because they believe it empowers them. In 1 Kings 18, the 450 prophets of Baal cut themselves for greater power right before God uh, had Elijah kill them when he brought fire down from heaven when Elijah prayed. Planned Parenthood, the death cult of Planned Parenthood, claims that it empowers women. In Proverbs 8, Jesus is pictured as the wisdom of God. Verses 36, uh, 35 and 36 of Proverbs 8 states this, Whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul and it ends with this all those who hate me love death the death cults hate Jesus so the Lord says to Israel you're my chosen people a special treasure to myself therefore you shall not resemble the pagan nations in any way because I am your God and you are holy, meaning you are separate, set apart to me, which means you are different from other nations. Just as Israel was called to be set apart from the other nations, making them stand out and look totally different in their laws and their worship and their dress code, the way they ate, the way they drank, their character, their behavior, their language. As Christians, we too are set apart a special treasure to the Lord, and we should not look like the world. And yes, this does include in traffic, right? My daughter, she has such road rage. When I drive with her, it's like I'm praying because she is like, ah! And I'm like, I'm glad you don't have a gun because, my goodness, <laughs> 1 Peter 2 9 states this You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, the Lord's own special people, that you proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. Now, verses 3 to 3 through 21 deal with um, dietary laws concerning what was clean and unclean for Israel to eat and what was forbidden and not forbidden. We went through that in Le Leviticus uh, 11. But just to highlight some things here today, um, things like camels, pigs, lizards, bats, seagulls, birds of prey, bugs, spiders, and shellfish were all unclean and forbidden for Israel to eat. So for me, with the exception of pork and shellfish, I personally don't have a desire to sample any of the other stuff. <laughs> I mean, Amen. imagine eating some roast vulture oh. or grilled bat topped off with spider legs and lizard feet. But concerning food, in Matthew seven eighteen, 
Jesus said, whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach and is eliminated. Thus, he said, purifying all foods. And he said, what comes out of the heart of man, that's what defiles a man. In Titus uh, 4, 3, the Holy Spirit said the hypocrites will come commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is, if it is received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Uh, when one of my daughters was learning how to cook, she insisted on cooking dinner every night. And this passage about thanking the Lord and praying for God's protection over the food became a must. <laughs> the kids be like, oh, she cooked again, Dad. <laughs> yep, you got to eat it. She can cook now, though. But boy, being the, being the guinea pigs was a rough one. Okay, so check out what verse 21 says. It says, you shall not eat anything that dies of itself. You may give it to the alien who is within your gates. He may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in his mother's milk. Okay, so roadkill was forbidden to the Jews to eat but they could sell it to a Gentile to eat. I mean, it's still good meat, right? It wasn't butchered or bred, uh, bled properly, so it wasn't kosher. Therefore, they couldn't eat it. But they could gift it to a Gentile or make a profit off of it and sell it to him. Then it says, you shall not boil a young goat in his mother's milk. Um, now, because of this, the Jews today will not eat a cheeseburger. They won't have a glass of milk or a sandwich with any meal if it has meat in it. When they cook things with dairy and meat, they have to use two totally different uh, utensils. They can't have it in the same meal. They say if you eat meat with milk when it hits your stomach, and starts to digest is boiling the meat and the milk together. And that dairy may have come from the mother of the meat that you're eating. I don't know how they came up with all that. But, but that's not what God meant. That's just people creating traditions and calling it the law of God. In Genesis 18, when the Lord and two angels came to visit Abraham, he served them lunch. Verse 8 of Genesis 18 says, Abraham served them butter and milk and the calf, which he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. If you show that to an Orthodox Jew, it'll mess his week up. <laughs> Boiling the calf in the mother's milk was a pagan fertility ritual. And, it, of course, it is just kind of cruel, but God said, you're my people, and you shall not do like these nations that are around you. You shall not worship me with the same practices that they worship. Mm -hmm. They do this as a fertility rite and add it into their worship. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. In verses um, 22 through, through 27, it deals with the yearly tithes given by the people. Um, the yearly tithe consisted of 10% of everything gained that year of grain, wine, new oil, uh, firstborn of their herds and their flocks. While they were in the desert, all they had to do is walk to the tabernacle and give their offering. But God says, once you enter the promised land and I set up the place 
that one place, which will be Jerusalem, you have to bring your tithe to the temple in Jerusalem. But the Lord told them, listen, if you live too far away to carry your tithe to the temple, then sell it. So think about it. Your tithe consisted of your the first part of your grain, the first part that your harvest, your firstborn of your cattle and lambs and sheep. It's like, okay, if you live too far away to carry that to, to the temple, sell it. And then take the money that you get, go to Jerusalem, and buy whatever it is that you want for your offering. The Lord said, you can spend that money for whatever your hearts desire, for oxen, for sheep, for wine, for similar drink. Bring that to the temple and make your offering and then sit, sit down in the celebration meal with me, the Levites, and your family. So this was a agape feast. It was a, it was a Thanksgiving meal. You brought your tithe of the year to the temple, part of it, went to you, your family, and the priest, and you sat down and just ate in celebration before the Lord. Because the priests and Levites, the tribe of Levi, had no allotment of land, the entire tribe of Levi was sustained by the tithes and offerings of the people. Therefore, God commanded the people, don't forget them because their entire life is de dedicated to serving in the ministry to you. By Jesus' time, the priests had made a racket out of this by telling people their sacrifices weren't good enough, but they could buy one that was temple approved for triple the price. On two different occasions, Jesus went up in the temple. The first time he made a whip of cords, but on both of these occasions that he went in there, it says that he drove out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of who sold doves and said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So in God's command, because, you know, you know, people used to say rules are made to be broken. People find a way to take God's rule and turn it around to profit off of it for themselves. His intent was this. You're coming to worship. You're coming to the house of the Lord to give praise, to worship. But it's too much for you to take all of this grain and your herds and cattle and come to Jerusalem. So bring the money. And when you get there, you buy the sacrifice, you offer it, and you worship. Well, by Jesus' time, the priests have figured out we won't accept anything that the people bring, but they can buy ours out of markup. So maybe you come with your little lamb and it's without spot, it's without blemish, the priest will look at it and be like, oh, there's a black hair. Give us that one. You can buy one of ours for three times the price, and then they'll turn around and sell the one that you bought them. So does that make sense? And that's where Jesus got mad and ran everybody out of the temple. They also had temple money at that time. Now, the thing about the temple money was it was only good in the temple because the whole world was using Roman money. But they would say, your Roman money is no good here, so you can exchange it for some temple money with a markup. So now you get this monopoly money to give back to the temple while they keep the Roman money. Verse 28. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand, which you do. So every third year, instead of bringing the tithe to the temple, they brought it to the storehouses and the pastures of their city gates. Then the poor people, the widows, the orphans, the foreigners, and the Levites could go get what they needed to eat. And they would eat full. So I guess it was basically like a storehouse for the city's poor and the Levites that would last them for three years. 
In my mind, as I was going through this, it kind of reminded me of being on a cruise ship and they have these 24 hour open restaurants, all you can eat. So it's like, here's the storehouse for the poor and the people. And so they were able to go and get it. Now, as Christians, the church is not required to tithe. We're invited by the Lord to share in his work by giving freely. The tithe was 10%, and 10% is a good place to start, but it's not a standard requirement. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16.1 states, Now concerning the collection of the saints, on the first day of the week, let each of you lay aside something, storing up as he may prosper, or rather as God has prospered you. Some of us don't earn enough to give give 10%. Others of us make so much that simply giving 10% would be an insult to the Lord. We're called to give to God with joy and not out of our obligation. Now, let me give you, uh, here's, give you an example of 10%. Let's say, and it's just an example, you make 100000 a month. Right? 10% is 10,000. If you can't live off of 90,000 a month, <laughs> something is wrong. I mean, if you can't live off of 50,000 a month, something is wrong. But if you only make 100 a month, $10 is a lot. Does that make sense? So, it's not 10%. It's as the Lord prospers you. Amen. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 states this, But I say this, He who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So instead of saying, Lord, I'm going to give you 10%, say, Lord, how much do you want me to give? Does that make sense? Now, the only place where Jesus actually spoke on amount of people gave, amount that people gave was in Mark 12, 41. It says, now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw, saw how the people put money into the treasury and the many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which is worth a fraction of a penny. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Surely I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had, her whole livelihood. And so that's the only place where Jesus talked about amount. It wasn't the amount that went in, it was the heart that went into what was given. Chapter 15. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of debts. Amen. And this is the form of the release. Every creditor who has lent anything to his neighbor shall release it. He shall not require it of his neighbor or his brother, because it is called the Lord's release. Of a foreigner you may require it, but you shall give up your claim to what is owed by your brother, except when there may be no poor among you. For the Lord will greatly bless you in the land which the Lord your God is, is giving you to possess as an inheritance. Only if you are careful to obey the Lord your God, to observe with care all these commandments which I command you today. For the Lord your God will bless you just as he promised you, and, sh and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You shall reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over you. 
Okay. If you ever take the time to read America's Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, you'll discover that almost all of it was to, taken directly out of the Bible. This is where we get debts fall off after seven years. And scripture is called the Lord's release. God gave this to Israel so that everyone could have a restart. Some might go through a bad period, but they would have the opportunity to rebuild their lives financially on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, it prevented a few greedy and oppressive people from becoming the super rich elite who love keeping others in poverty as long as they prospered. However, they were allowed to continue the debt charge on those who were not. Jews who were not Israelites. Mm -hmm. Now the Lord said, "Was you when you obey me, there will be no poor among you, um, and you will not have to release your Jewish brothers of any debt because everybody will be doing well." I think that this condition um, possibly could have been locally or even for an entire tribe if they obeyed the Lord. Because when we get to verse 11, it says, for the poor will never cease in the land. So the nation as a whole would always have poor because the nation as a whole would never completely obey. Mm -hmm. But if different cities and possibly uh, tribes did obey, that entire tribe or that entire city would be uh, La Jolla slash Martha Vineyard. Just rich, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody will be borrowing anything because everybody will be being blessed. So the Lord says, if you obey, I will bless you just as I promised you. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You shall reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over you. What's amazing about uh, Israel and the Jews is in the nations where they have been scattered, even in their disobedience, the Lord has blessed them and made them lenders and not borrowers. The nations that bless their Jews are rich and prosperous. But the nations that oppress the Jews are rid themselves of the Jews most of those nations, when you look at them, their citizens are in poverty. The government, and of course, the leaders, they live like kings, but their people don't. Hitler figured if he stole all the Jews' money, all of the Germans would get rich. It worked for a minute, and then God destroyed Germany. So, you look around the world... The Jews are lenders, mm -hmm. not borrowers. But that's God, right? They haven't come to this place where Israel is reigning over all the nations, but we'll see that in Revelation, where everybody's going to come to Jerusalem. Verse 7. If there is among you a poor man of your brethren within the gates of in your land, which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. Mm -hmm. Beware, lest there be a wicked thought in your heart saying, the seventh year, the year of release is at hand and your eye be evil against your brother and you give him nothing. And he cry out to the Lord against you, and it become a sin among you. You shall surely give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all the works in all which you put your hand. For the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore I command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, your poor and your needy in your land. I think the big point in this, in this passage is verse 9. Beware lest there be a wicked thought in your heart and your eye be evil against your poor brother and you give him nothing. 
the Lord is saying, basically, check yourself and give careful exam examination to the thoughts and intent of your heart and mind. Don't look at your poor brother and think to yourself, I'm not giving you anything because the Sabbath year release is only 18 months away and you won't have to pay me back. And then I'll have to forgive you the entire debt. <laughs> Helping people is never about getting a return or making a profit. We should help for no other reason than to just simply help. When we do help those who are in need, we are actually blessing the Lord. Because Israel as a nation never completely obeyed the Lord, he said nationally the poor will never cease from the land. So bless them generously. Proverbs 19, 17 states this. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord and he will pay back what he has given. So think about this. Your hands are this big. How big are the Lord's hands? The Lord says, open your hand and watch what I put in it. But we'd be like, I got to keep my hand closed to keep what I got. It doesn't make sense. Galatians 6, 9 states this. Let us not go weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. Therefore, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to your poor and to your needy in the land, because for this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in all your works and all which you put your hand. Verse 12. If your brother, a Hebrew man, our Hebrew woman is sold and serves you six years. Then in the seventh year, you shall let him go free from you. And when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go away empty handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, from your wine press, from what the Lord your God has blessed you with, you shall give him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing today. And if it happens that he says to you, I will not go away from you because he loves you and your house. And since he prospers with you, then you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear to the door and he shall be your servant forever. Also to your female servant, you shall do likewise. It shall not seem hard to you when you send him away free from you, for he has been worth double a higher servant, serving you six years. Then your Lord, your God, will bless you in all that you do. Okay, so we covered this in Exodus chapter 21. However, when we look at this, remember, God made man free and equal but men made slaves of other men. So the Lord always reminds Israel that they themselves were once slaves and he is the one who freed them. Um, when we think of it, when it comes to slavery, um, it's nothing God ever looked on with favor or indifference. In fact, what we think of when it comes to slavery it's actually a sin, and the Lord called for the death penalty upon those who engaged in it. In Exodus 21, 16, it states this, and with no uncertain terms, he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, surely he shall be put to death. So God is not with that. What God was doing here, he was setting a standard that all life is valuable and all people are his special creation above everything else. All men should be treated right because God created man in his image. Therefore, all people are precious in his sight. All lives matter. In those days, 
um, some people would find themselves in debt and fall up and fall on a hard time. So what they would do is they would go contract themselves out or their sons to someone for six years as an indentured servant. Once they completed their contracted time uh, or they had worked for the seven, the, the six years in the seven year, they were released and they were free of all debt. Right. So the Lord says, don't get mad about setting them free. And when you do set them free, bless them abundantly. So God says, I want you to remember how I blessed you with all the riches of the Egyptians when I freed you. Remember, God says, go plunder the Egyptians because they're going to want to get rid of you. And so they went and they asked them. They were like, all of our kids are dying. Here, take what you want. Go. So God says, I want you to bless them so that they won't, they won't have to start off homeless and broke. See, God says, you blessing them is a head start on their new life of freedom, just like I gave you a head start on your life when you left Egypt. Now, verses 16 and 17 says this, and if it happens that your slave says to you, I will not go away from you because he loves you and your house, and since he prospers with you, then you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be your servant forever. And also do this to your female servant likewise. Many people found that life with the master was good. Their life couldn't be better anywhere else. Under the master's house, they got a family. They got a great job. They had more benefits than they could ever achieve on their own. Plus, it was a good and safe place to live. In these situations, the servant would say, my master loves me. My master treats me better than I could ever treat myself. And I love my master. I love my family that he's given to me. Our children are being educated and treated well. It's a nice neighborhood. I don't want to go anywhere. It's at this point the servant would tell his master, I'm willing to give myself to you as your slave for life, not because I owe a debt, but because I don't want to be anywhere else than serving you. So his master would pierce his ear, signifying that he has become his slave for life by choice. The New Testament calls this a bond servant. Every single person who has accepted Christ has chosen to be his slave or his bond servant for life. I mean, think about your life before Christ and think about how you have prospered since accepting his offer of salvation. You may not be richer. You may not have more of the world's goods, but you do have the security of eternal life. You have Jesus as your master, and absolutely no one loves you more than him. The Lord loves us so much that he died for you so that you could have life eternal. But if you're still having a problem with being a slave to God and having to listen to somebody, this is what the New Testament writers wrote about it. Romans 1.1, 1, 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. James 1.1, 1, 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1. Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Jude 1.1, 1, 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. They all said, I have willingly become a slave for life to Jesus Christ. And if you, just in case you say, I choose not to be a slave of Christ or a slave of the devil, I'm in the middle just doing me. Romans 6.16 says, Do you not know to whom you present yourself slaves to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. 
In other words, there is no gray area and there is no middle ground. As a person, we are either serving the devil and a slave to sin, or I'm serving the Lord and a slave to righteousness. But it is with my free will that I get to choose who will be my master. Or put it like this. I get to choose whose slave that I want to be. But you're going to mind somebody. Verse 19. All the firstborn males that come from your herd and your flock, you shall sanctify to the Lord your God. You shall do no work with the firstborn of your herd, nor shear the firstborn of your flock. You and your household shall eat it before the Lord your God year by year in the place which the Lord chooses. But if there is a defect in it, if it is lame, blind, or has a serious defect, you shall not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. You may eat it within your gates. The ceremonial unclean person and the clean person alike may eat it as if it were a gazelle or a deer. Only you shall not eat its blood. You shall pour it on the ground like water. All right. In the book of Malachi, um, the Lord talks to his people about robbing God. And then they ask, in what way have you robbed you? And the Lord says, in your tithes and offerings. Malachi 1.6 says this, Where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name? Yet you say, in what way have, you, have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar. But what way have we defied you? defiled you. You have defiled me by saying the Lord, the table of the Lord is contemptible, contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer that then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? The point is this. As born again believers in Christ, forgiven children of God, we should from our hearts willingly and thankfully with joy give to the Lord our first and our best. We shouldn't offer the Lord whatever is left over. It's like seeing a, hungry, uh, a homeless, hungry person outside of a food establishment that you're about to go in. And you step around them, you go in, you order your food, you eat to your full, but then deciding instead of throwing what's left in the trash, I'm going to go bless that homeless person and give them something to eat. Well, in reality, you're just giving him your garbage, right? It was, I was going to throw this away anyway, so I'm just going to give him my garbage and say it's a blessing. That's how God is saying, don't give me stuff like that. Don't give me what's left over. Um, when we started, you know, in, a long time ago to help us make rent, we used to do yard sales, church yard sales. But we learned real quick to tell people, don't clean out your garage with your garbage and bring it here. Bring us stuff that you would still use and still wear. Don't bring us the lawnmower with one wheel and the chair with two legs. That No. <laughs> People are like, oh, this don't work no more. So give it to the church. Give it to God. No. So we had to put in there, bring stuff slightly used that you would still use. Stuff that you yourself would buy. That's just the human heart. Sadly, in our humanist the Lord naturally comes last. You know, I, I, I get to serve on a prayer line and people call in often and it's like, well, do you attend the church? Oh, no, I don't have time. But I need God to answer this prayer for me. And it's like, well, I mean, it's two hours out of a week. Like, 
Oh, no, I, 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 I don't have time. I got this. I got that. But pray this for me. Our humanness, the Lord naturally comes last. Think about it. We will not be late to work. We won't skip outings. But can't find that same devotion to be in fellowship and to be in fellowship on time. We can go out and splurge on whatever we want, but dread giving to the Lord. Job 5.11 says this, 5.8 says this, but as for me, I would seek God and to God, I would commit my cause who does great and unsearchable and marvelous things without number. He gives rain on the earth and sends waters on the fields. He sets on high those who are lowly and those who mourn are lifted to safety. The Lord's grace the Lord's mercy, the Lord's love for you and me is beyond comprehension. If we think about all he has done for us, we should, I should, be filled with overflowing joy and thanksgiving. I should be thankful. I should be strengthened in the joy of his salvation because the joy of the Lord is my strength. His mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. His love covers all of my sins because his grace has no bounds. So I should be thankful. And like Rita Springer sings, when I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me up, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost, how he picked me up, how he turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid ground. It makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Amen? Amen. Lord, we do thank you. And we want to ask you to help us keep our hearts thankful. Lord, let us not be Janet Jackson Christians asking, what have you done for me lately? Let us be filled with stones of remembrance that the joy of the Lord is our strength, that we can be grateful in all that we do, all that we have, and all that you will do. We praise you and we glorify you. And for those listening to this message and you don't know the Lord Jesus and you know you want that security and that rescue from yourself, if you believe he is God, I'll just say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I do believe that you are God in the flesh, that you were born of a virgin, that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose again from the grave in three days. Forgive me of my sins and receive me as your child. I thank you for hearing me and accepting me in Jesus name. If you said that prayer, you have been introduced to God and you are now one of his children and part of the church called the Bride of Christ. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.